Um, well, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and thank you for joining today. Um, and welcome to our penultimate event of, of Climate Week at Royal Roads University. Um, and I am Maria Bremner. I am the Climate and Sustainability Manager here at Royal Roads. And I'm not just delighted, I'm very, very excited to introduce this session on artivism, disruption and climate action with these amazing panelists and artists. Um, but before we begin, I'd like to just acknowledge the lands. Uh, Royal Roads University campus is located uh, on the traditional and ancestral lands of the Kalakwangan speaking peoples, the Songhees and Kosepsin families and ancestors. And I'm truly grateful to work here and live in this very special place uh, and to be a member of this university community, but also to connect with these lands um, every day. Um, and you know, one thing we've been talking about these last several days, um, and in particular today, there's some good messages um, from some friends and colleagues around sort of leaning into discomfort and responsibility. And this acknowledgement for me is also an affirmation of my own responsibility in my day-to-day -day life, uh, personal, professional, to be a good guest and visitor in my time here. Uh, and to strive to work in a way that um, cultivates relationships, um, that's built on respect, um, that fosters reciprocity. And despite sort of the discomfort of it also within sort of how I'm implicated to recognize the historical and ongoing effects of colonialism, both um, direct and systemic and to work in a way that really supports uh, and strives to foster the sovereignty of Indigenous peoples. Uh, so wherever you're calling in from, I really encourage you to take a moment um, to reflect on the lands that you're on and your own connections um, and also your own responsibilities uh, to place and people in this very hard time that we're in. Um, today's panel uh, that we have today is about climate change and the idea of art as activism in this space. Um, and art has a really long and honorable and exciting and important tradition of being engaged in the world that we live in. And I think at no other time is it vital and important that we not look away. Um, art has an incredible ability to connect with our emotions and our senses in a way that other forms of communication and interaction can't. And art is also a really exciting point of entry for people to engage. It can be political um, and it can be filled with deep purpose and intent. And in its essence, it's creative and at, at no other time do we need that creativity. Um, I would like to thank the Resilience by Design Lab and the MA in Climate Action Leadership Program for helping sponsor this panel and our Community Climate Campus event tomorrow at the Gorge Park Pavilion. So please head out to that event if you're in, in person in Victoria. Um, and this is part of our efforts to really try to accelerate climate action and engagement uh, in diverse and inclusive ways. And now I have the great privilege of introducing Bruno de Olivier Jamie, uh, our moderator for today's conversation. I have really enjoyed getting to know Bruno throughout our planning for this event um, and just throughout everything. So thank you, Bruno. Bruno is a queer activist, award-winning scholar, um, working on the edge of what's next. His work aims to benefit seven generations to follow because his practices are anti-oppressive, decolonial, community-based, community and action-oriented. Dr. De Olivier Jamie says he cannot imagine social change without the arts because the arts surface stories that have been told, untold, undertold, wrongly told, and suppressed through colonization. He is a visual artist and an art educator with 25 years of dedication to creativity and a commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion. 
He is currently an assistant professor in art education at the University of Manitoba and the coordinator of the Master of Education in Arts, Community and Education, where he teaches courses on community art, visual thinking, visual anthropology and arts-based education. And driven by a commitment to social and environmental justice through the arts, his work has a global reach, including research projects in Canada, India, South Africa, Jordan, and Brazil, and I'm sure many other places, Bruno. Uh, he holds a Social Science and Humanities Research Council grant titled Museum Hacking with the objective uh, to challenge museum Eurocentric narratives. Bruno has a vast track of academic publications um, and is co-author of the book, The Nature of Transformative Environmental Adult Education. So thank you, Bruno. Thank you to all our panelists in advance. And I turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, Maria. Maria, you, you reading that? It makes me feel so old. <laughs> thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Thank you so much for, for, for the invitation. I was born and raised in Brazil and I, I, I came to Victoria, BC uh, over 20 years, old, 20 years ago to learn English and for three months and I blinked <laughs> uh, 20 words and by and I'm still here. And every time that Royal Roads and the Research by Design Laboratory and Maria and Beverly and, and, and Robin, whenever they invite me to anything, they have my, my yes by default. They don't even need to ask what it is. I don't even trust what it is. It is always yes, because um, when I moved here and when I and I worked at uh, Royal Roads before for a few years and it's a place that I fell in love and it's a place that I fell in love every single day that I walked into a campus into what that I walked into my classrooms to teach so thank you so much for the invitation thank you so much for the panelists uh, I'm so excited to have this conversation. And uh, just before we start, I'd like to remind the audience that this session has been recorded. So if you're, if you're BFF, your mom, your dad, your colleague, your grandkids want to see this in the future, just uh, it's going to be available for you. Thank you, everybody, for uh, sign up for this session. And I also want to invite you, if you are in the, uh, on the island, to come tomorrow to, to work. We're going to be painting a collaborative mural together. And uh, I have pieces and bits of the mural here that is ready to go tomorrow. So I'm very excited about that. So thank you so much for the invitation. And, as, and thank you for the beautiful opening, Maria, as you're talking about uh, uh, doing your land acknowledgement. I always remind my students that land acknowledgement is, is about taking actions. And it's an invitation for taking actions in, in, uh, in decolonizing and uh, indigenizing curriculum. In my case, uh, we talk about curriculum all the time. How, how, if we live in a perfect world, how a decolonial classroom would look like, how a decolonial art gallery look like. I work very much with museum, how a decolonial museum would look like, because those institutions, those art institutions, they, they work for the public good. And I don't think they, they're doing a very good job at the moment. And this is one of the reasons that we are gathering here today to, to have these conversations about what, what are we doing and what can we do and what can we do it better. For our conversation today, we have Lorna Germ... Germ... Yeah, Germ Germside. Germside. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank Germ. you. Laura, thank you for being here. And Damon Gills and my friend from Brazil as well, Peruzo and Andrade. So thank you so much. Um, because going back to what Maria was saying in the beginning, we don't know the world that is decol. We know the world that we we see, do, and perceive today. Everything that we do, see, think, feel, it's colonial. Every, I will repeat, everything that we do, see, feel, think about is colonial. 
And uh, my invitation is to, to, to the audience and to my panelists to reflect how would this world look like to uh, if, if uh, colonialism never happened? What the world would look like if colonialism never happened? And what is it that we're doing today that can contribute to a better world? So, um, Laura, you wanna, who are you? What do you do? <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Bruno. Um, my name is Lorna Germscheid. Uh, my artist name is Germsch. I'm a visual artist focused mainly on pen and ink illustration. I'm grateful to be working and speaking to you from the traditional territories, uh, territory of many nations, including the Sasagas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, um, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, um, and what is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Um, the city of Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, yeah, in light of this acknowledgement, um, like what Bruno was talking about, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what inspires most of my work, which is celebrating and bringing attention to biodiversity here in the city, um, in so-called Canada, and the need to protect this biodiversity, which is under constant threat due to colonial and capitalist practices. Um, as an artist and settler, I feel strongly about the role of art can play in supporting truth and re reconciliation and the 94 calls to action. I don't think we solve anything related to the climate crisis while ignoring these relationships and um, the need to uproot the system of the systems of oppression that exist here and all over the world. Um, we know that indigenous peoples uh, steward approximately 20% of the planet and this very small share contains 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity, which not only means that the impacts of development um, affect them disproportionately. It also means that it's really vital to support them in their ability to defend their lands. And for me, um, because I'm an artist, I feel I have responsibility to find ways to support and amplify these voices in the work that I do. Um, I'm a self-taught art artist. I'm actually quite new to the world of visual arts, but um, you know, being a newcomer here, uh, and also being self-taught means I'm in constant learning mode and always listening. And I hope that this comes across in my work as I continue to find um, ways to achieve some of what I've just talked about. Um, but a lot of what I do currently is focused on advocating for bird safe buildings and using my art to prevent window collisions. Um, I started as a volunteer with Flap Canada that's the Fatal Light Awareness Program a couple of years ago. And uh, a fellow volunteer and I decided we wanted to do more than just collect data in the form of dead and stunned migratory birds. So we decided we would tackle the University of Toronto's St. George campus um, where we were finding dead birds. And we knew a lot of these buildings were problematic. So this led us to starting a group called Bird Safe U of T. And I've been able to apply my art to postering, illustrating, um, infographics, um, creating animations, outreach materials. And probably what I'm, um, oh, here we go. <laughs> probably what I'm most proud of uh, is incorporating illustration into feather friendly treatment. So um, as you can see here on the shared screen, this is a clean design film that uh, I illustrated in partnership with Feather Friendly, um, and it's been used on several campuses now. So this particular one was used, um, was uh, donated to Fleming Bird Conservation Committee um, at Fleming College. Um, so art being used to literally save the lives of birds. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of this. Um, and uh, it's received lots of positive feedback and is leading to current and future projects. And it's so good to know as an artist that my art isn't just art for art, the sake of art, but it's literally, you know, saving lives um, and doing conservation work. Uh, with my pen and ink art, uh, I actually started getting serious with this and learning the practice of it through the pandemic when 
just to bring in some money. I was a stay at home mom uh, with two kids in lockdown. So I started doing pet portraits for people. Um, I still do a lot of those, but I wanted to start a print series, um, get away from all the portraits I was doing. Uh, and I knew it had to be climate related somehow. Uh, I mean, at this point, I believe every job needs to in some way be a climate job, but I also knew it had to be climate related somehow because art for me is also therapeutic. Um, when I take my grief at the current state of the world and my overwhelming concerns and sit quietly and can be mindful and focused on something that I believe will ultimately share a message and that can channel um, this energy and these feelings, I just feel so much better and I feel like it gives me the energy to get out and and do more um so art um artivism is a necessary tool for me and I think it's cool to think about how art is as much a necessity for me on a personal level as it is to inspiring behavioral change and the role it plays in supporting climate justice movements and climate action um so anyway that's a bit about me and what I what I'm up to Lorna, Thanks. how long, how long, how, how big is this one that you just showed us, this ink work? Um, that is, what is it, 18 by 24 inches? <laughs> how long, how long does it take you? Uh, that was, that was a long time. I, I don't, because I work in spurts, I don't, I didn't actually get a long amount of time, but, um, someone brought, it might have been Robin, actually, somebody brought up to me, like, the, the act of all those little lines. So when I talk about therapy, I'm I'm talking about just being, you know, ch -ch 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 -ch, you know, and all of these tiny little lines eventually making up uh, a larger image. And I think that's a nice metaphor for what we do as an artist um, when it comes to um, artivism or climate action. It's all these little tiny acts. Um, coming together and and adding to a bigger picture so so uh, so your, your your process here so you have a theme that you want to explore you have like a reference you do like a mood board how does it start well yeah <laughs> getting back to my learning and like this is a, a learning process and I'm I'm constantly learning ways that I can um, amplify you know, voices and and be, um, as Maria mentioned, like, just be a good steward here. Um, I, so I had originally, I wanted to do a print series and, and originally I had uh, titled it Nature Based Climate Solutions, but in all of my research lately, in the last couple of weeks, to be specific, I've actually learned about the harm of nature based climate solutions and how um, you know, we're talking about decolonizing and nature based climate solutions are, uh, I, I don't mean for my art or my prints to um, be seen through a colonial lens. It's more about rewilding and pr preservation. I, I don't want it to be, a, you know, a market based sort of initiative going into and, you know, making a bunch of kelp farms and taking over land. I, I want it to be about a celebration of kelp farm and kelp farms. And so that was like the first in the series. Um, I have another one that I'm working on right now. It's natural burials. So again, it's like, how can we rethink what we're doing? And e even just like the way we bury our dead, why do we do what we do? Why, why is the last act yeah. of our lives to poison the earth you know there are there are better solutions and nature teaches us what these solutions can look like so um i wanted this print series that i've been working on to share some of that messaging and um so that particular one is called farms and i i did a role reversal i i also am really against you know the thought of fish farms and now octopus farms um it's like bonkers that we would do that to a sentient very smart and intellectual being um that we share the planet with um and yet this is what's happening so um i wanted to take these giant pacific octopus and and kind of get a little bit whimsical with them um i think that a lot of 
the solutions that exist also, they require a certain amount of imagination. And, and so I wanted to also incorporate that into some of my work. And so having octopus as farmers kind of <laughs> seems to fit the bill there, so. Wonderful. Thank you so much for doing this work, so necessary. And I want to acknowledge that um, what you're doing, it's so above and beyond being uh, um, a professional, being an artist, being a woman, being a mother in a world that was not designed for women, you were such a warrior. And I'm so thankful that you are in this world doing this oh, work. Likewise. Thank you so much because it's hard, then it gets harder and then it's hardest. So you are so, so brave in a world that was not designed for women. Thank you. Damien. <laughs> Damien, what you do for a living, Damien? I, uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me, Bruno, and everyone that's uh, collaborated to put this together. Uh, I, and I, I do want to just begin by acknowledging that I'm coming to you from unceded Liquita Kwakwakiwak territory in uh, what is also called Campbell River, British Columbia, has also been called at one point the salmon capital of the world. And uh, the, I've decided, I think, in my life to really just focus on what I was born into. And I think as as settler people uh, who descend from from uh, immigrants from other countries, in my case, Europe, uh, various places in Europe, we could still feel connected to a place and uh, and the land uh, in our, in our own way. And I think a lot of the work that I do is about uh, and the de decolonization component of that is about allyship with First Nations up and down this coast, from from the Coast Salish to the Kwakwakiwak to the Heltzik and the Simshian and the Gixan and the various people that I've worked with uh, around commonly shared values, which are basically grow out of this landscape and this coastline, uh, which is where I've chosen to really focus in my life uh, and my work. And I'm raising three uh, small children at this point uh, in this community in the same place where I grew up. Um, I moved to Vancouver to go to UBC and start my my career in film uh, and ultimately got kind of pulled back to to the coast and to the the values that were imbued in me from a very young age. And those really revolve around ancient forests and wild salmon uh, and, and all the, the components of this interconnected ecosystem that makes this world and also these cultures uh work for over 10,000 years on this coast so um I I guess that's what I'm sort of plugged into and I come at it in a multimedia multidisciplinary way and so I I think uh, it, this is the first time I actually heard this term artivism when you uh invited me into this uh conversation I think it's it's perfect and it actually uh describes really who I am and what I do in a lot of different ways um uh so who knew um but my my story really my family history is you know, for multiple generations since my my parentage immigrated from places like Poland and England uh it, it is uh in Ireland uh was in logging and oil and gas and mining so that's kind of my not my my parents they they were teachers but uh my uncles and aunts and going back uh several generations that's they were part of this industrial economy uh of british columbia and so me doing what i've done is a really good source of uh of uh fun tension at uh, christmas parties and things like that when i get together with my other family members who i'm actively sort of you could say campaigning against uh <laughs> their work and vice versa but uh, but but the you know the human in us we 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 find a way to get along around that. Um, I had one aunt who was the the sort of the the black sheep, if you will, of the family, uh, who uh, went off and became a scientist and uh, biologist and became the president of the Alberta Wilderness Association, uh, which is uh, which is not the funniest thing to be in it, one of the only environmentalists in Alberta. But uh, I, actually, there were many more than that. But she bequeathed to me kind of a love for nature and was the person that was getting me subscriptions to wildlife magazines and things like that as a kid and got me plugged into a campaign 
for the to protect the Carmana uh, wilderness, which is not very far as the crow flies from Royal Roads uh, University. Uh, and so at the age of 10 or 11, I went around and took petitions to my classmates and many of whose parents also worked in the logging industry because Campbell River is very much at the center of um of uh of re of the resource economy here in BC and today is home to fish the fish farming industry and other things. So uh I've always kind of been right in the middle of it here. And um but the thing that really I think ties into this artivism, what catalyzed that for me, I had this poster that my aunt got me of the with the camera looking up at, towards the canopy under these towering Sitka spruce in the Carmana Valley. And it was part of the wilderness committee in BC's campaign to protect that place. So every night I'd go to bed looking at these trees in the forest and it gave me a sense of peace and, and inspired awe in me. And I think my, my whole life since then has been about recreating that in other people. And it's not, you know, at the time that was, using photography and the tools that were available to them. Um, part of my work has been exploring technology and always trying to find new ways uh, to reach people. And that's what I think artivism or uh, really where the art in activism comes into play is it's, it's, an, it's a tool to reach people on an emotional level and then to somehow convert that into action. That's basically the whole chain reaction of, of, of art and, and activism and, and social change and policy change. So um, that that's taken me into all kinds of storytelling and using conventional documentary work, but also exploring social media and how to use that to connect people to campaigns where they can write letters to politicians and get them to change laws. And, and that's taken me through issues like uh, the Enbridge pipeline, uh, fish farms and wild salmon, uh, logging in ancient forests um uh and local protection of local environmental issues i'm working on one right now just to protect the salmon creek that's pretty much in my backyard with with a with a mix of my neighbors essentially and we're kicking the butts of uh, of a big uh, multi-million dollar developer here in town uh by using a lot of these same kind of tools so um I, I, one thing I just wanted to kind of end off on is is an example of where, as I said, where where this has uh, led me to most recently is uh, is using uh, immersive film and virtual reality to, which is not really virtual reality, it, it, immersive immersive media to uh, take people into ancient forests and give them a sense of what makes these places so special and different from a tree plantation where we've cut the forest down. And I was taught growing up in this community that the circle of life is the loggers come in, log the forest, the, the trees go to into the economy and build houses. And then they come, we come around and plant trees and it all grows back. And then we cut it all down again, 80 years later. And that's, that's natural. And it's not because what is the the complex web of life that characterizes an ancient forest can never be recreated and we're down to a very small uh two to three percent of our a forest land base that can that can support ancient forests today so that is kind of I, I end where i began which is in these forests and acknowledging their importance in terms of climate in terms of flood and fire mitigation in terms of uh, the human soul, and 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 also all the myriad life forms, from lichens to fungi to mosses to wildflowers to insects, etc., that are part of this web of life, and trying to get people not only to understand that intellectually, uh, but to to internalize it emotionally, and then to somehow translate that into action to to protect these wild places. So um, that is uh, where I'll leave it. Uh, thank you. That's beautiful. Damien, have, uh, where's, what are the places that you have done that, that, uh, that exhibit? Okay. So the, the picture that you saw there, it's been an evolving exhibit. It, uh, it, it's called Sanctuary and it started, uh, telling the story of the Dakota Bear, uh, Sanctuary on the Sunshine Coast near, uh, between, around Rob, Roberts Creek area. And, uh, and so actually this is an interesting example of where, 
a number of artists were invited in. This was a, a total artivism project. This, the Sunshine Coast Art Center invited, and, and some of the local environmental groups invited artists to come there to witness the, the, this forest that was on the chopping block, literally, uh, and to present a series of uh, artworks to, to help in a campaign to preserve it. It was very last minute. It was down to the wire. It was about to be logged. And so this is what uh, we, a little team I put together came up with. And I brought in some, some immersive VR people I knew from Emily Carter University. And we went into the forest and we created this exhibit. And it started at the Sunshine Coast Art Gallery. But then it played has played at the PUSH International Arts Festival, um, at the uh, Vancouver International Film Festival. At, it had a three-month residency at the Museum of Anthropology at uh, UBC. Uh, it's played at the North Van Art Gallery. And in those exhibits, we integrated other indigenous art and cedar practices uh, around because this was home to uh, to culturally modified trees that go back hundreds of years uh, from the Squamish nation uh, and also home to the largest density of bear dens. So the, these these ancient trees hollow out over time and bears climb in them and, and, and nest throughout the winter and have their babies. So there were 33 active bear dens in that area that would have been cut down. Uh, and so this exhibit was actually uh, one of uh, actually a number of successes. I'm, uh, you know, I'm proud to report this stuff actually works and that forest was protected uh, through an arrangement between the Squamish nation that uh, we partnered with in this storytelling and uh, and uh, the province. Um, and, and so it, it that has now expanded to other chapters that have, that we've added to this about the inland temperate rainforest in the Kootenays. And that's a place where I've done a lot of work as well with an organization called Valhalla Wilderness Society and some local First Nations there as well. Uh, and we've had some success. You may have heard about the Incoma Blue Forest that was protected earlier this year. It's one of the largest, actually the largest tract of protection that's happened in, in five years, I think, in this province. Uh, and I had done a film about that, a conventional film, six or seven, eight years ago that toured all around the province. It was part of an online campaign. And ultimately... Thanks mostly to the work of those uh, hardworking conservationists and deploying these these tools and um, that force is being protected as well. And now we're building on trying to get other additional pieces of this rare inland rainforest protected through uh, through other uh, additions to this 360 exhibit and other conventional and social media pieces as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. We need we need to take that work to <laughs> to win it back. <laughs> Well, let's talk. You you know about museums out there. Let's let's make yeah. it happen. Yeah. We need to take. We will talk. We need to take it to. Yeah, yeah. When it's all about need, deserve, deserve you too. So I'm I I'm not surprised that that uh, the term RT visa come as a novelty because it's 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 quite of a new term if you think of if we think of. Uh, art history in general, because artivism, the term as a very loose term, uh, didn't uh, come into, into people's mouth until like late, late 90s, about like 1995 ish, 1997. And it started actually with, with Latin people. Look at us, look at us doing, <laughs> doing interesting work. It started with the, the Chicanos. In um in in Los Angeles and and with the heavily influence of the uh, movimiento zapatista or the zapatista movement in Chiapas, Mexico, and it started as a a uh, uh, group of of Latin artists that immigrated legally or illegally to to the United States, and it was about immigration and politics and immigration laws. But it was so powerful and so strong that the term act, act, artivism, uh, art and activism, uh, it start being adopted by other areas as well. And, and later in the uh, 2000s, it start being adopted to refer to, uh, to the, this more contemporary anti-war art movements, anti-globalization art movements. And, and very recently, uh, with uh, the post-human era that we live in now um, about the environmental and technology issues that uh, we experience. So it's quite it's a quite a new term for sure. 
Ah, Peruso, Peruso, my friend. How are you? I love I'm you. I'm good. I love you too, Bruno. Oh, Bruno, Bruno was the <laughs> my uh the first person that I met, first Brazilian that I met when I moved to Canada in 2014. And uh this human being literally uh his presence just it's transformative and he in since then we've been connected we've been together we've been um chatting and and thinking the world and cosmologies and um thank you so much everyone who put it that's this together i'm very honored to be here and to be among those amazing artists um like damian it was the first time that i heard about the 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 term but it makes a lot of sense as soon as i heard it was like of course like like a, because art for me was always an expression of activism like i my family comes from the interior of brazil i a region that we called here in brazil that triangulo mineiro and i was born in araguari town in Minas Gerais uh, by my mom Tania Rizedo who is a Spanish and Portuguese family comes from like Spanish and Portuguese family settler and my dad who is a Cafuso man who comes from a black and indigenous background Afro-indigenous man and I am a father to a two and a half year old Inewa Tiju and a husband to an amazing human Aaron Gilpin um and I will just share some of um, some of the, the the work and some of the screen grabs and stills that uh, of the work that I do. I start working as a photographer about like uh, twelve years ago, and then um, since I I like uh, move to Canada. Uh, since I traveled to Canada, I pursued a master's in social dimensions of health with a focus on film-based methodologies, identity, and indigenous governance. Um, what happened here, it's like uh, I was raised in between the city of Uberlândia, Minas Gerais, and the small rural area that my grandparents were raised and were born and my dad was born um it's quite rare to find now in the circles that i i walk through but my dad was was born in the bush of a mother uh like a, a mother who was 42 years old by herself and uh a doula and that informed my my upbringing my dad was always um, like a bringing us and like showing us the importance of being with the land and like uh, showing the importance of uh, like a showing us the cosmology and the understanding of how to we belong to and we are coming back to the land and that connection with the land informed my entire upbringing. Um, so my, my work as an artist and filmmaker, as a community member, a father, it's for the land, right? I, I want to serve those, uh, traditional and indigenous communities that protect knowledge systems. And those knowledge systems are ancient in a way that we kind of like understand, we, we, we're trying to carbon print things. We're trying to find numbers that, oh, we are here, like they were here for 10,000 years, oh, they're here for 14,000 years, but we are the land and this, I am the land. And then through that, I started like uh, bringing my, my, my work to Titian and try to, to show like uh, the people who are from the land and don't think too much about it, but leave it. Um, so um, today, like a like a, we will share, we will uh, talk a little bit about 
the work about the work that I have with my production company, what they started learning. Um, I work uh, specifically with CBC Indigenous, uh, uh, APTN, Vice. Uh, I was recent a jury member in the Beth Mountain Film Festival. Um, and I've been doing a great work with the journalist Emily Gilpin, who is also my sister, uh, with Coastal First Nation to amplify some voices and some, some issues that's happening right now. Um, I like uh, since I became uh, a father, uh, things change like a uh, like strongly, right? Like uh, I always was involved in art. I I like I think when I started thinking about artivism, I was like, oh, when was that I understood art and activism in my mind? I was trying to pinpoint some some places, some people who were there. And then I come from a generation that started their, their lifetime without internet. And then when internet came, I got to know like many, many work of like music, for example, like Rage Against the Machine. And I was like, whoa, wow, what those guys are talking about. And I was in touch with Bob Marley. Wow, what's the guys? Are... And then later, Banksy, all these kind of things like started like a like a come to my 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 cosmologies, my understanding of the world, and this informed my my work. Like uh, I I try to show that disconnection with the land, it's what we it's going to save us. And indigenous leadership, it's the way of. Um, of like a like a think the world like Bruno asked us to do um with like a without colonization. So it's basically that a little bit where I come from and the work that I do. There you go. Thank you so much. The, mm -hmm. This work is so so beautiful. It was just so beautiful. And I get goosebumps when I hear such like a like a young progressive artist just like you saying things about the connection, the work that we do. It's about connecting with the land. And I honestly get goosebumps when you said, I am the land. Because we are, we are the land. And that and and the fact that you see yourself not detached from it, but um, but part of it subject your subject of the land not an object on it uh it's very polyphrenic and i can go on on this forever and, <laughs> uh and i have a question for for us to 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 bounce ideas uh and i want to uh, uh pick it up on what you just said about that you are the land um and things that um in my case, for example, the work that I do, uh, I, I it's 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 about the research, how research in with and for the arts co-create knowledge about about the environment and more specifically about uh, the climate. Um, and for example, for you, Peruzu, you your your key thing it seems to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, it seems to be the fact that you're subject of the land. For me, it's the research, and I love a Picasso quote that he said, um, "Nothing is art; everything is research." <laughs> and what what are you? Um, can you can you share uh, uh, you D uh, Damien and Lorna what what's your vision for art and how can art contribute to um, consciousness and to inspire uh, uh, climate action for Peruzo for example is the connection with the land what about Lorna and Damien what are your 
a vision for how art can contribute to raising consciousness. Uh, hi, uh, I'll go first, I guess. Uh, yeah, I don't think that we can, I don't think that we can address environmental and um, climate related issues without art. Um, I think, you know, first off, a lot of these issues um, are tied to the need for resistance um, to our current systems rooted in this colonial and capitalist thinking. Um, and I think art is the most powerful form of resistance because it um, it transcends barriers to communication and it often gives a platform to those voices that have been silenced. Um, it reflects feelings within our communities and brings community together. And community and these people-powered movements are essential to change making um, because change isn't going to happen from our, you know, elected officials. It's going to happen through like these grassroots movements. And um, I can't think of a single movement, uh, people-powered movement, that doesn't have art um that is attached to it and as Damien had mentioned earlier you know with um the you know social media being a tool you know like the the use of infographics to get like these visual cues and information to people through like they they educate quickly you know we're uh, people are devouring this information so quickly so to have you know these visual references um that we can use as outreach um even just poetry that uh, all forms of art i think are can be forms of resi resistance um and a very effective um way forward for creating change so um that's something that i've been thinking about thank you and uh uh i love that you 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 mentioned the art is is a powerful force for resistance, and evoke feelings, and I think that, uh, and that is that is the way that I see it. That it might connect to what you just said. What the the reason art it's 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 a powerful force that you mentioned. It's because the art touch, art touches people, art gets to people's heart, plays with their emotion. Uh, who never cried watching a movie? Who never wandered, let their, their imagination fly when they read a book? I often, when I'm so en enchanted by poetry or by, or by a movie, I always find myself not even breathing, holding my breath or breathing through my mouth. Uh, who never who never got emotional when they saw uh, a performance, when they saw dancers, when they saw people moving their bodies. So I think why, the reason why the arts are so powerful, it's because they touch, uh, art touch our heart, make us wonder, makes, make us dreams. And like Paulo Freire said, uh, uh, the arts help us to uh, imagine an alternative reality. And once we imagine alternative reality um, and we name that this reality, we name possibilities, we have, we are left with two choices. Choice number one, we stay where we are or choice number two, we work uh, in uh, pursuing this new alternative reality that we know it's possible. So thank you so much for your words, uh, Lorna. Damien, how do you connect your art? Well, first of all, I, I really want to echo what Lorna said about uh, there is, no, I, I've never seen a, or been part of a, a successful uh, campaign uh, to protect the environment in some way or some social value that didn't involve art. Uh, and so I think to the extent that art is central to the human experience and we need a broad based human movement, uh, social movement in order to uh, affect policy change, to 
make it clear to policymakers that they have to uh, go, you know, along the will of the people on this, then it, you, it, it doesn't work without art. And, and it is sort of a, a natural part of this constellation of the organic movement building that happens around a, a, a something that transcends just a campaign and becomes a social movement. Art yeah. will have to be there uh, and, and right at the center of it for that to work. And I, I think uh, part of what it does, which, which you've just noted, is it moves people in a way that facts and figures and the science doesn't. Um, and, and I almost, to me, kind of break it into two parts uh, when I look at art. One is the storytelling and narrative part and the kind of Joseph Campbell sense of that story and character are, are deeply rooted in our DNA and that we are just, uh, we connect with the with other people's journeys. And when we get to know them and care about them, that's what makes a film work generally or a book, a, uh, you know, a, a novel is that we we follow the journey of, of someone and, and we connect with that and that takes us into that world. Uh, and, and so uh, that's part of, I, I'm a resident filmmaker with the Climate Disaster Project, which is uh, anchored at UVic. Uh, my friend, Sean Holman, uh, former journalist has created that, but it's now 20 plus universities around the world and different journalistic entities that are plugging into that. And the, the animating, thesis of that whole project is that um, far too much of climate journalism has been about science and facts and figures and policies and not enough about the people on the front lines of climate disaster who are experiencing the effects of climate change and that we need journalism uh, to better uh, reflect those human stories if we want to move people. And then I would say that going beyond that is also this other side, which is like what Lorna is doing with her with her beautiful artwork it's 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 this ineffable uh quality of of in the spiritual quality of imagery and music and these kinds of things that can touch the soul in in, in other ways so i think those are you know the the kind of the different elements that i think about when i think about art and, and activism yeah it's um i want to go back to this later on today um, the fact that uh, we cannot imagine um, art without community. Art is politics. Art is not art is not uh, neutral and uh, it's 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 political and it is highly political. Art is, is scary. And I know that because <laughs> my students are afraid of it and it should be scary. Art is a scary thing and it should be scary because if it's not, it's not doing its, its job. Um, Piruzu, how about you? Other than being the subject of the land. So yeah, art for change. Like um, today I woke up uh, very early in the morning. I'm here in Brazil because I'm a, a part of like a, a capoeira event. I'm coming um, to the group of capoeira that I'm I, I'm a part of, and I was today doing some beating bows. Beating bows, it's an instrument like uh, that leads the the rodas in the capoeira rodas. It's literally one piece of wood with one string and one amplifier that we call cabasa. And um, I was talking with my professor and he told me something very, very interesting because we were talking about art. We, we, we were specifically talking about art and how it uh, get emotional and, and like, a, like we get emotional about art. Art moves us through emotions. And he stopped me and he's like, actually, I don't think it's just emotions. I think art is logic. Art is science. Science is art because it's a creative process and everything that's creative it's art so and we don't stop creating at the moment that we start start breathing we start creating doesn't matter like a what and how but we are created creating so where you put your your energy it's like a it's what it's going to become your creation, what you're co-creating with your with your life. And then, then like a Paulo Freire 
Like what do you are dreaming? What do you are like co-creating for your future? You know, we see much, a lot of like a Hollywood movies and everything, like a lot of destruction and violence and all this kind of thing. What as human beings we are co-creating for our future? And that's when like a indigenous leadership comes to fruition, to to our to our hearts, to my heart specifically, to my DNA, to my genetics, because art is everything. Literally. Yeah. Science, politics, emotions, logic, darkness. So in my work, I hope to create a media that educates large societies about the role of indigenous governance and leadership across areas of like a land stewardship and traditional knowledge mobilization, right? And I like a, it is art. It's like a, it is the only thing that we have that it's. A, a maxim like that's like a it's a law an universal law that's everything is going to change and art it's the factor that changes everything yeah. so i'm like i'm engaging in a project of like a featuring cultural revitalization and strength-based approaches to indigenous represent representation in film and then like a i come from a oral storytelling family and um yeah, oral storytelling is a culturally grounded practice. Like, uh, it's uh, relevant to many people in the like a, a vehicle to translate knowledge in ways that go beyond the the, the written world and word, right? Like, uh, in this way, um, yeah, in this way, art is everything. In, in like I don't believe like science it's not art I don't believe like politics is not art everything is art yeah and um it is it is when I'm teaching uh I teach a course called community art and my students we do some some graffiti I teach some graffiti some murals some 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 things that I know and then and then they're like Oh, I don't know how to do this. I'm not an artist. I don't know how to like art, art, art. I was like, you stop it. You stop it right now. Because like like you said, Piroz, everything that we do see, it's it, we we are touched by the hands of the of an artist every single day by the second that we open our our eyes in the morning to the second that we close our eyes at night before going to bed we're everything that we look like everything this 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 everything was thought uh and created by the hands of an artist um so community you you all keep saying about community 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 this community that's <laughs> how do how do you peeps how do you involve communities in your artistic projects or do you involve them at all at all i think you do because you keep saying it um and and so how do you involve community in your in your work and um and how does this in, this engagement uh contribute to the broader goals of climate action and, and social change my work is it's very community, community focused, community oriented. It's about my the work that I do, it's on murals, uh graffiti. So <laughs> it's about getting like we're gonna do it tomorrow. Um with uh <laughs> over 200 people. You can get you can't get more community oriented than that. But how about you all? How about you, Lorna? Do you involve community at all in your thinking process? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um so I I'd like to maybe share a couple of the a couple things. Um, the first one before I got involved in Bird Safe U of T, I had um recently discovered birds. <laughs> I was one of those pandemic bird people, and uh, I was just like in awe at how many species of birds I did not know. <laughs> but that existed. And um, this coincided with me, uh, my family and I moved to a different rental and we were really, really lucky to um, get a place that backed up onto a, a park, like a small but beautiful park. And um, 
I I got my first pair of binoculars and was just like, oh my gosh, these are all birds I've not they've they've been here the whole time that I've lived in this place, but I've never seen any of them. And I'm like, what other worlds have I missed? What other worlds have I just completely ignored because we are so disconnected. We consider nature something that we experience. You know, there's the city that we live. And then, you know, if you want to go experience nature, you rent a cottage or you go for a hike somewhere else. But it's here. And, um, you know, like birds, birds, this they migrate. And so they connect us in ways. Um, and we're so lucky to have them visit um, during the spring and the fall. So. I, I was thinking like if if I don't know that all these warblers and thrushes and various species live in my backyard, maybe my neighbors don't either. And I wanted to share that with them. And then while I was learning about not only the birds that that, you know, visit, uh, just the threats that are um, they're confronted with and how many of them are threatened or species at risk and and what's happening to their populations there, you know, we lose just to window collisions alone in North America, uh, we lose an estimated 1 billion birds. And um, I started to learn about so much of the misinformation that is uh, that continues. Uh, a lot of how I thought we protect birds against window collisions was actually totally wrong. Um, people are still using hawk decals as a way to uh, mitigate bird strikes and that's just something that we were learning in the 80s when I was growing up and why hasn't this why hasn't this become part of our our narrative so I I decided okay well I'm gonna make a poster I'm gonna use my art and I'm going to draw a backyard bird poster because they exist for North America they exist for the province but for my my park I want my neighbors and my community to know that these birds are here and um, it was just like a gentle way of sparking conversation. And, um, and then also fundraising for FLAP that does a lot of work with um, this outreach and this uh, education. And then a lot of my neighbors also have giant windows. They have these huge homes with giant windows and glass railings. And so it was also a way to um, get some of these people on board with maybe also treating, you know, taking action and doing what they can to help um, educate and, and just make their windows bird friendly. Um, the second thing I'd like to share was just um, a bird safe U of T initiative. Um, so my bird safe U of T partner, Carly Davenport, she was able to make some inroads at um, Vic College. It's a college on U of T, St. George campus, um, and successfully arranged for us to organize a day where we had student volunteers join us in painting the ground level windows of EJ Pratt Library, the giant windows, and we've found a number of birds there. So we knew it was fall migration and lots of birds were going to be hitting these windows. And we thought, Okay, well, I had, I had already experimented with oil-based paint markers on my neighbor's glass railings and my windows, and I knew that it worked. I had seen it done, and, and um, I designed a birch tree, um, a, a simple birch tree design pattern that we printed out as a template and um, invited students to join us for the day, just drop in whatever time they had to, to give to us. They could just pick up a a marker and and get on a step ladder and help us paint these windows and by the end of the day well it was a series of days um we had the whole ground level of this library treated it's a temporary treatment but it will last into spring and we knew that we didn't have to worry about these windows or collect data at this and not only did we apply art and this like art mural to these windows, but in the process, we were able to engage the community. Um, we had students telling us, oh, this was such a nice way to, to spend our time. It was therapeutic. It was calming. We got to, to meet new people. And they also learned a lot about why we were doing the work that we were doing and um, and what it looks like to, to treat windows effectively. So, um, yeah, those are a couple of ways that we've engaged community. That's fantastic. There's um, uh, there's a very nice quote here that Shania put on the chat. 
we live in a capitalism it we live in capitalism it's power it, its power seems inescapable but then so did the divine right of kings any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings resistance resistance and change often begin in art very often in our art the art of words um very very powerful and this i will say i will go back to this uh after uh hearing from Damien but I just want to put there in the books that I'm going to go back to that Damien how do you connect community well first of all I think film is an inherently collaborative medium uh and and so it like it takes a lot of people to, to create a film you have people that are on camera you have people behind the camera you have the process of even editing a film I, I like to welcome uh, input throughout that process and share a rough cut with people and get their impressions, have a focus group or a, a discussion. Um, but you know, more than that, you know, right from the beginning and the conception of a project, particularly if it's a, I'm bringing some technical skills and some storytelling skills to a community, um, the conversation begins right from the beginning. And it's really, it's, it's their story. So I'm there to kind of help uh, provide what I can from my end to bring that to, you know, reality or bring it to a screen or to an audience. But even that process it, it, all the way through is going to be, uh, is going to be collaborative. So I think there's a, and then the community is involved in creating that story. Uh, hopefully they're proud of it and they're part of the sharing of it as well with the world. And, and so and that, you know, I, I love the, you know, that distribution part, which is where you can invite the whole community and people from far and wide to come to a screening at a, at a theater and be part of a, a discussion after like we're having here today and to share that around social media. Uh, and so that's kind of networking and how you how you build the uh, how you build a movement and an audience and how you take that piece of art and, and uh, get it out into the world. So I, I think there's a, but there's also an element in, in documentary where essentially it's just, a, it's a feedback loop because people are out marching in the streets. They're demonstrating about, I guess, the pipeline or, or, or to protect wild salmon. If you're there with a camera and, and you're able to document that, and just be part of the process of recording what what history is being made, then you can put that back out into the world. And it's just an amplifier, uh, essentially, of what the community is already doing. Uh, and I think that's really important. That's a role that we have to play is basically bearing witness, uh, you know, with a camera, a still camera, uh, a video camera, audio recordings, whatever it might be, because it becomes part of the historical record and, 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 and the firmament upon which you just continue to to build the movement. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. No, it does. It does. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's all, po it's all about politics it, because it is politics. Art is politics. And since it is politics to me as an, we can just look around. We're going to see evidence of this. Uh, it's important. We cannot do the work by simply changing legislation, for example. You can change legislation regarding, um, regarding climate action as much as we want. But if we don't change education... Um, nothing happens right so and we've been using you i i hear words such as storytelling co-creation of knowledge is there any other element of education that you see that you use in your work that it's embedded in your work or you uh cautiously use in your work um uh education it's on the in my family um, kitchen table all the time. It's important to share that my wife, who is a co-director of our company, What They Start Learning, is a recent hire from um, and with the, the Emerging Indigenous Scholars Circle here, there, 
that right at Royal Roads and is a new faculty member of the School of Communication and Culture. So what we try to, uh, what we not, what we try, what we do in our work as a community engagement is filmmaking workshop, create support educational opportunities for youth and local communities to, to be able to, to tell their own stories. So we are gonna stop having stories who comes from outside in, from stories who comes from inside out. And, and in this way, we are very motivated and focused on the role that education like has in, in, in the work of art, right? And education in itself, it is art. Like I said, everything is art. Thanks, Pirito. I think too, um, in regards to education, like you had mentioned earlier, Bruno, uh, there was the quote, the Picasso quote, uh, quote uh, about research, and um, in like the the print series that I've started to do, it's all research based. It's all, you know, um, figuring out what to what to feature and how to feature these interconnected relationships and and biodiversity and like systems um, that exist in nature and and the hope is that when you through whatever art whatever medium um, when it's researched and, and when it's coming from a place of knowledge or even just feeling um, that is not only sparking a curiosity which is you know um, initiating conversation and, and education, it's also teaching in a way, right? Because somebody's looking at a poster or, or um, a print or reading a po poem and they're asking questions. And if they don't know um, something that's featured, they, you know, they're inspired to go look and check out, you know, where it's coming from or, um, what is what is a part of that art so i think it's all as peruzo mentioned it's education is a form of art or art informs yeah absolutely how about you damien i just well i just want to share one little piece of what i'm working on right now which is to sort of i really believe in the power of immer of this immersive technology that, that i've mentioned here uh, it, it is an educational tool, particularly about these ecosystems, because it can put you right in the middle of it. Um, but I think that the it's been hampered by the fact that up until now, the, the VR experience has been about putting on a headset, which is very anti-educational in a lot of ways, because you, you, you would re have to have everybody wearing one of these things on their own, and they're not connected. It's not a social experience. It's like a class of kids, uh, and, you know, being together and experiencing something. Um, and it also, there's other elements of that experience that don't work for people. They can't, you know, actually make them sick wearing a headset. So I, I really, we, we came to find this dome idea was something that was very uh, inviting and and social. And so that was how we wanted to approach this forest uh, piece. And we also have some funding from Creative BC and the BC Arts Council to add interactivity to this. So that we can, you can imagine a class being in there and being able to explore different elements of this forest, uh, like the understory, like the mycorrhizal networks, like like uh, macro images of the of the fungi and the flowers and and insects and other things that they can trigger themselves and that they can kind of go on an experiential journey through a forest. Now, ideally, they would go to a forest, experience it for themselves, but. Uh, that's not necessarily always accessible to everyone uh, for obvious reasons, but I still want people to understand, you know, what, how, how forest and how wild salmon and nature works. And I think that this immersive technology has, has the power to really help with that. And so the other thing that I'm working on is uh, we built a DIY dome projection system for these exhibits, but I'm developing some technology with a local organization in Campbell River here uh, to make that a portable uh, dome system that's easy to set up and that uh, can travel to different schools and that would be affordable and accessible for 
uh, for schools and museums and art galleries um, around the world. That, that doesn't really exist today. There are like corporate things that would be just not, uh, not accessible to most audiences. And I, I believe that if we can make immersive media available to a lot of people, that it could open up uh, greater possibilities for nature-based education. So that that's uh, and and it could apply to other other elements of art and culture as well. So uh, that's that's something I'm working on. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for, for pushing the boundaries there. And one of the things that I I've noticed uh, working in in the academia, working in the classrooms, working with youth, is the it's the need and the push to to get the arts and get the uh, get the arts involved in different areas of of knowledge in science in math so uh my students are always asking me uh how does it look like and and i there's conversation about steam stem which i could talk about this wherever um uh, but um one of the things that I that my my students struggle with, um, for for it's it's like I mentioned earlier. Oh, I don't know how to do art. I'm not an artist because, and the reason is people have a preconceived idea of what art is or how things should look like, and if things don't don't look like in the way that they imagine their in their heads of what art is therefore it's not art therefore they cannot make it so having uh, 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 having the arts as part of the science curriculum of math of everything it's first of all it's difficult it's not easy it's but it's very possible and my suggestion, and very important, it's necessary. And my suggestion is, the first thing that I do is, um, it's to change the question. Change the question from what is art? Because art, the question of what is art? Uh, people, ha uh, since Plato are trying to answer this question, and it, I don't think they're doing a good job because they haven't fully answered yet. <laughs> so since Plato, they're trying to answer this question, what is art? And that, and that question is very problematic because it put art in a box that, okay, this is art and therefore everything that is not this, therefore is not art. So my suggestion for those that work in, um, in the realm of incorporating art in, in, in different areas of knowledge is change the, the question from with your students of your community, change your question from what is art to what is art for? Because whatever we, the community, the classroom, the teachers decide what art is, whatever we decide, what can we do with it? What is the purpose of? So my first, my first suggestion, uh, Melina, is to change the question, what is art to, what is art for? When you start asking what is art for, uh, community artists will emerge within your community because whatever art is, crochet, photograph, collage, baking, whatever that is, what can we do with it? And everybody can make something. Everybody can do something. Everybody can make something. So whatever you can make, what can we do with it? Uh, also something that it takes a little bit longer, but uh, it's need to be done is when we were working with, with, uh, uh, with our community, with a group of or your student, whatever you, you define your community, it's very important that you establish the community. And uh, it, it, this is so, I find in Peru, you're gonna get this, but I find it so difficult to explain community to Western and North America, because the sense of community is embedded in the Latin culture. We don't think about community, it's there. We don't have to establish. So it's there, it's there. And I cannot even explain, but 
So create this sense of community by being with the community. I teach a, a community art course every Saturday. That is all day long from nine, nine in the morning to four in the afternoon, every Saturday. My first hour of the class every Saturday is just having coffee with my students and sit and giggle. And how are you? What did you do? Oh, I'm good. What? Oh, how are you today? I'm fine. What, what makes you so fine? Ask questions, ask questions. People will, will be resistant in the beginning. They will open up at the end. <laughs> when my students do the silly teaching evaluation at the end of my courses, they always go back to the to, to those informal conversations that we get to that we get to do. They say that was the best part of the whole thing. That's when we learn so much from, from each other. There's there's when we uh, co-construct all this knowledge and understanding. That's when we tell stories. That's when we share our perspectives. So two things, Melina, change the question. Know what is art? It's what is art for? And then create create a community, establish your community. And, and in North America, that needs to be purposeful. You need, you need to think through this. Um, um, so your artists will emerge and we have to stop to think that people who make art are just the artists. Yes, we do make art because we're artists, but everybody, uh, I don't say, I'm not saying that everybody's an artist. I don't buy in that discourse because to become an artist, it's in the same way that no, nobody's a doctor, nobody's a lawyer, nobody's an artist. It takes a, it's a, it takes years <laughs> and it's very expensive. But everybody has the aptitude of making art, of producing art, because the word art or artist it comes from uh, making things out of our hands, out of necessity or desire. And this is like prehistorical uh, uh, way of looking. So we make things out with our hands to out of necessity of desire, and that's art. Uh, so everybody is able to contribute once the co once we start asking, what is this for? And once the, the community is established. Um, you're welcome. We are very short in time, and unfortunately, um, uh, there's 32 people here. Speak up. Do you have any question, any comments to, to the panel? Bruno, I did ask one in the chat. Ooh. Oh, did you? What is that? Can you repeat? I was just wondering if everybody could give like some final words as to what we can take forward as audience members so that we can maybe bring some artivism into our lives. Even though we might not be artists, how can we sort of incorporate that artivism for climate action and a better planet and a fair, more just planet? What are their takeaways? To me, are uh, the 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 keywords that I uh, things that I if people could remember these three things, three things. Um, nothing's neutral. Everything is it's telling you something. Art is telling you something, and what is it that art is telling? And we need to be able to understand and decode these codes, these visual codes. So what is it that art is telling you? Um, art is, 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 artivism is, is about community. And um, the power of art, I wanna go back to, to uh, Lorna uh, opening speech about powerful forces of resistance and art different from everything else art touches our heart and that is the difference because once we are moved we are able to 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 change changes doesn't happen without touching our hearts otherwise we wouldn't care those three things and uh, uh, oh sorry sorry go ahead you, you go 
I, my response to it was just, um, artivism is, you know, the artists, um, myself and my fellow panelists, we um, are using our art to raise our voice to, you know, climate initiatives, taking climate action. I don't think that is just, um, that doesn't just apply to the arts, that applies to everything. And I, as mentioned earlier, I think that every job, there's room to make it a climate job. There's room for climate action in, in whatever you're doing. And so to find whatever that is, I think we're all being called right now in the face of this impending doom <laughs> and crises. And, and like there's multiple genocides happening in the world right now. Um, I think we all have a responsibility to raise our voice, um, you know, and just the act of creating. Um, if you if maybe you're not an artist by trade or that's not your career, but just creating is a form of resistance. Um, you know, rejecting these capitalist ideas and, you know, like make gifts for people this year, you know, you know it, um, get personal with it, slow down, um, be mindful. Um, that's all something that art asks us and gets us to do through the process. So, um, so all those things. Beautiful. I, as you said, Bruno and, and Lorna earlier, art touches the heart. And I think it also comes from the heart. And, and uh, I, I recall the moment in the movie about Johnny Cash when he's uh, in the studio playing for Sam Phillips. He's auditioning for a, a record deal. And he plays him some song that he's learned that was from somebody else. And he said, you know, it's not moving me. Like he said, imagine that you were dying in the street and you had just enough time to play one last song to tell the world who you were, what would that be? And that's when he, he goes into, you know, his, the, his first uh, song uh, and, 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 and it, he, fit, he finds his voice. And I think that you can do that for yourself and ask yourself, what is it that you have to like, that comes out of your authentic self that you want to, you want to add to the world through your, your work. And if you, if you follow that, if you follow your heart, I think you come up with something authentic that will touch other people. And maybe it's not something that you can execute solely on your own. Maybe it's a concept that you then invite the community in to help you with like a collective mural or a film project or something. But the, that original idea that, that comes, comes out of your, you know, out of your authentic self has uh, th that's the building block that you can, you can, you can build a project around. And so, I think it's first of all listen to your own heart and and bring what you have to the the issue and to the world and 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 then involve other people in that don't put all the weight on your shoulders that you have to have it all figured out or that you have to because I you know the kind of work that I do I could never do by myself uh and 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 it, it is inherently requires a, a village to to create and when you do that then you get buy-in from a large number of people and it becomes something that, you know, can come from the community out to the world and, and actually make an impact. I definitely echo what everyone said about it. Thank you so much, Beverly, for the question. And I think the the key thing is to decolonize your thinking. Decolonize the, the way that you are thinking about art, decolonize the way that you think about the impact of your art. Um, we have a big, big um, thinker here, indigenous thinker, Nego Bispo, who just passed away, but an, an amazing elder who contributed a lot here in Brazil for, um, for, for art, arts based. Uh, Nego Bispo say that um, if you sing out of tone, if you write in a wrong way, if you speak in an accent that's not the right one, don't worry. You are not colonized enough. So you're in the right track. That's it. Thank you so much. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> well, I think that those are some beautiful, powerful words to to end this session with. We we are at time, but I do want to just raise my hands to all of you artists, artivists, leaders who who are leading ways of change in really transformative ways. And 
Thank you for all being here um, to our guests online and in the rooms. We really appreciate you showing up here. Um, and, you know, Peruzzo, I think perhaps your words uh, are as a disruption or a, an interruption of the cosmology. And I think that that's also an invitation for us all to be deliberate and intentional about that interruption and a, an invitation to sustain that interruption of perhaps damaging ways that our world currently is and in an invitation to come together in collective ways that are that are helpful in in working together against some of these very dire times. So thank you all. Um, we'll talk to you soon and hope to see you, some of you at our Climate Canvas event tomorrow. I'll be there. <laughs> yes, you should, you should be there, Bruno. <laughs> hope to see <laughs> you there. You, thank you so much. It was it was so wonderful. Thank so you, thank inspiring. you, inspiring. Your words are so inspiring. Um, make us believe. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. And if the audience have any uh, burning question, uh, feel free to send me an email. Um, people ask about examples of the work that I do. I, I put my website there. You can uh, um, jamie.com. You can look at it. If you have questions, my email is, email is there as well. I'm I'm quite often in responding to things. So if you want to come and hang out in Winnipeg with, with me, you're welcome to do so. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you very much. And Lorna Peroso, you're amazing. Thank you, Let's thank you. Beverly. Thank you, thank Bye. you. Bye, everybody. Do we have Bye. to go? Bye -bye. <laughs> <laughs> we have to go. I